Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the feast of your transfiguration on the mountain, with purity and holiness, with divine praises, and with hymns of the Holy Spirit. May we be filled with spiritual joy and gladness, and raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to Jesus Christ, the radiant light beyond description, who shines forth from the Eternal Father. He revealed the mystery of the most exalted Trinity to us on the day when he was transfigured on the mountain, and he revealed the mystery of his divinity to his holy disciples and confirmed them in the true faith when they saw his glory. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, you showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush that was not consumed. In ancient times you appeared to your people in a pillar of fire, in a cloud, in lightning, in a clap of thunder, and in the sound of a trumpet. Likewise, on this day you chose to fulfill your plan of salvation for us. You went up to the mountain top with your disciples, Peter, James, and John, and you were transfigured before them with the light of your divine glory as your clothing became dazzling white. They saw Moses and Elijah and heard them talking with you. Then Peter said, 
Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Then they heard the voice of your Father from heaven saying to them, This is my beloved son, my son the beloved. With him I am well pleased to listen to him. They fell to the ground and were overcome by fear, but you raised them up by your great power and enlightened them, ordering them not to reveal this great mystery until after your passion and resurrection in Jerusalem. Now, O Christ, our God, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense to fill your church with the great light of your transfiguration. Confirm us in the true faith of your apostles. In your compassion, forgive our sins. And in your mercy, remember our departed. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Christ our Lord, when you were transfigured on the mountain, you called Moses and Elijah to witness to you, and you confirmed the faith of your disciples. Accept our prayers and the fragrance of our incense. Grant us joy and happiness with you in the light of your eternal kingdom, where we shall continuously praise and glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Kadi shantalu ho kadi Shout with joy from the mountains, Jesus showed himself as Lord. Offer praise to the Lord God, his face brightens all the world.
A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone was so glorious that the Israelites could not look intently at the, faces of Mo at the face of Moses because of its glory that was going to fade, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit be glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation was glorious, the ministry of righteousness will abound much more in glory. Indeed, what was endowed with glory has come to have no glory in this respect, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was going to fade was glorious, how much more will what endures be glorious? Therefore, since we have such hope, we act very boldly and not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the Israelites could not look intently at the cessation of what was fading. Rather, their thoughts were rendered dull, for to this present day the same veil remains unlifted when they read the Old Covenant, because, though, because through Christ it has been taken away. To this day, in fact, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their hearts, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, Holy Spirit, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen in your glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Lord Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothing became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and these were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say, 
they were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. And then from the cloud came a voice, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This is the truth, peace be with you. And immediately, immediately looking about, they saw no man anymore, but Jesus only with them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> this is actually verse 8 that I just quoted. Transfiguration, when our Lord, when this takes place, this is both a universal and an individual lesson for us. Universal by the episode of what takes place, and individual by the context within the gospel. And as ever, I encourage you to read the, the full context of chapters 8 and 9 of St. Mark. Because that's the resolution in the end. When they look about them after all of this event takes place where our Lord takes Peter, James, and John up Mount Tabor by tradition. We don't know the actual name that's given, but from centuries, from the very beginning, it was always claimed to be Mount Tabor. The scriptures don't give us a name because in fact it doesn't really matter. The mountain that our Lord takes them up upon is meant to be the alternative to Mount Sinai, where the law was given to Moses. Remember Sinai being covered in fire and cloud and light and the lightning and, and the trumpet sounds and all of that. This mountain is where our Lord reveals himself as, in a sense, we can say, the kingdom. Remember the previous quotation that we have quoted today as our Lord says to the, to the men who are around him that some of them who are standing here now will not die before they see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God coming in power. And so what our Lord is doing by taking Peter and James and John are two things. One, on the psychological level. He's teaching Peter, James, and John who he is truly in his glory. This radiance of light and this transfiguration that takes place of our Lord is not miraculous. It is what belongs to him by being the Son of God incarnate. If you want to talk about miracle, we'd have to talk about miracle being the fact that our Lord didn't radiate his glory throughout his lifetime. Just appeared to us as a man. Appeared to us in this simplicity as a tradesman, as a carpenter, as the son of a carpenter. So what our Lord does for this one moment is show the glory that he comes to bring to the world. And as we mentioned on the psychological level for Peter, James, and John, because these are going to be the same three men that our Lord is going to have with him in the Garden of Gethsemane a year from now on the night of his arrest. And it is meant on the psychological level to remind them that hopefully in a year you will remember this moment of glory. Peter's overwhelmed by the whole thing. All three of them are terrified, we're told. They don't know what's going on. They're just overwhelmed by the radiance of our Lord. And that's the idea of the three tents. On one aspect, it's terrifying, but on the other aspect, it is absolutely gorgeous. This is magnificent. And so let us make three tents, three shelters, one for you, one for Elias, and one for Moses. And we can keep this. The idea that everyone likes the nice part of religion. We like when we go to church and it feels nice. We like when we pray our rosary and it feels good. I feel at peace. I'm comfortable. We love that part and it's very much a part of the religion. Our Lord does console us. But remember, consolations are not defined by feelings. Consolation in the spiritual realm, in the realm of what we call ascetical and mystical theology, 
Consolations are those gifts from God which make me persevere in the service of the gospel, in the life of the gospel. It may be cancer that I die from, which giving me by the grace given to me to see the conformity with our Lord's cross on Calvary gives me strength to persevere in this illness. That's a consolation. Doesn't feel good. I don't have any warm, tingly feelings. I'm not, I'm at peace though. Peace will always remain part of consolation. So what our Lord is doing here psychologically for Peter, James, and John is giving them a foretaste of what the glory of the resurrection is meant to be and to encourage them for the trial they're going to undergo over the next 12 months and especially on the night of our Lord's arrest. Now after this takes place, as they're coming back down the mountain, our Lord tells them, you speak of this to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Now that's the universal aspect, that's the kingdom. And obviously you've noticed that within our anaphoras and our prayers, we are always talking about the Malkutho, the kingdom. This revelation of God's omnipotence in creation, his omnipotence and the manifestation of his will and direction in the, in, within creation. It is something which has been established historically, beginning with the preaching of John the Baptist. It is something that we await for in the full glory which will take place on the day of the resurrection, in the triumph. It's something also that we wait for in its full glory in the beatific vision of the divinity. It's why our greeting and our wish upon the dead is that they may be brought into the fullness of the kingdom. So the kingdom is something which is historical. The kingdom is something which we wait for. The kingdom is something which is visible on earth. It's the body of Christ, the church. And it is something which is invisible. It's something within us that transforms us from the inside out. Which is why in the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom today, note before the praying of the Our Father, we ask that the kingdom come to be within us to strengthen us in our weakness. So it is something outside of us, something inside of us, something historically in the past, and something which we move toward. It's the mystery of the kingdom. It's why when you read the Gospels, you'll see the kingdom being spoken about, the Malkutho, in all types of contexts. Now that's the universal aspect, this kingdom coming in power, which is why our Lord says at the beginning of the Gospel today, there are some who will see the kingdom come in its power. All they had seen up until this point was the preaching of John the Baptist, and now John the Baptist is dead. And so you have this whole contrast that goes back and forth, but this is the moment of power that our Lord shows them. And so this radiance and this light which is given of our Lord is meant to illuminate our minds, as we always talk about, the illumination of the mind, the transformation of the way we judge things, and therefore the transformation of the way that we act. That light is to given to us individually so that we ourselves become lamps, as it were, to others to bring illumination. Peter, James, and John are chosen, each for their own position, because they're meant to be central to all the 12. And so they're given these special gifts, one, the transfiguration, and two, to be with our Lord alone on the night of, of his passion, because both of them have, a th have something specific in their vocations that they have to do to bring to others. So that's the universal sense of the transfiguration. And the individual one, this is much closer to home for each one of us. In this context that we read in chapter eight, if you notice in this text, it says that some will not die who are here now and they will see the kingdom, fine. And then it says, and after six days, he took Peter, James, and John, they went up the mountain. So the six days. What is St. Mark referring to this period of six days? So we have to look at the verses just before to understand the individual aspect of what the transfiguration is for each one of us. 
And of course, when St. Mark says after six days he, this transfiguration takes place, he's making something which, which would echo among all the people of Israel hearing this story because it means that the transfiguration takes place on the seventh day. And the seventh day, of course, portrayed in Genesis is the day of rest at the end of the first creation. So St. Mark is telling us on Shabbat, on the day of rest, on the seventh day, this is the new creation, the transference from Mount Sinai to the mountain of our Lord, the transference from the old covenant to the new covenant, which is why in the transfiguration, Moses and Elias are with our Lord and we're told speaking to him. But the command at the end, the voice that comes from the cloud is this is my beloved son. You listen to him. This transference from the law of Moses and Elijah. Elijah and Moses give testimony in this glory of who the Messiah is and the voice from heaven says, this is my son, you hear him. There's, not a, there's a continuation, but you, the law of Moses and Elias are fulfilled in the Christ. So when we go back to the six days, the six, the six days before was Peter's famous confession of faith. When our Lord takes them to the north of Galilee, asks them, who do, the son of, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they give all these ideas. You're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. You're Elijah. You're all one of these prophets. And then our Lord says to the apostles, and who do you say that I am? And Peter's the one who speaks, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And the whole episode, of course, of our Lord praising Peter because this is something which has been given to him by faith by his heavenly Father. And not something he's just figured out with his wits. But of course, we immediately see what takes place as our Lord makes the first announcement of his death in Jerusalem. After this takes place, he tells all of the disciples around him, in Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the authorities. I'm, the Son of Man is going to be put to death. And on the third day, he'll rise again from the dead. This is the aspect of religion that we do not like, carrying the cross daily behind our Lord, which is why Peter immediately reacts to it. No way, Lord, is this going to happen to you. No, 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 no. The Messiah is glorious. The Christ is magnificent. Betrayal, being spit on, scourged, killed in Jerusalem. No, not happening. And our Lord turns on him and he calls him Satan. Shaitan, get behind me. Because your thoughts are the thoughts of men and not the thoughts of God. I have told you what is going to happen. So this is the six days, this is the, the seventh day before the episode of the transfiguration. Do you remember that in Hebrew the name Shatan, Satan, means adversary. I have announced to you the path of God that the Messiah is going to be betrayed by his own. And Peter can't accept that aspect of the gospel. Now you'll notice also that when our Lord announces his passion, he always finishes by saying, and on the third day, he will rise again from the dead. That part they never hear. They don't understand it which is why it reflects what our Lord says coming down from the transfiguration when he says to Peter, James, and John, you tell no one about this until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. He's confirming the whole episode with Peter and his confession of faith. So Peter is highly mortified because in order to arrive at the resurrection, the only path will be Calvary. Christians understand that the cross is not a condemnation. It's ultimately the path and the blessing which leads us to the fullness of light and the kingdom. It's a great mystery. 
It's why when you hear these mega churches and they preach their gospel of prosperity and all that, if you were really faithful and send me a thousand dollars, then God will send you a half a million, that type of preaching. It's insane, not only is it insane, it's blasphemous against the Messiah. Our Lord doesn't teach that at all. On the contrary, one moment he's praising Simon Peter for his profession of faith and the next moment he's calling him Satan. And then you could imagine a big hug, but I still love you, but you're still satanic. satanic. And, but notice what he says, it's because your thoughts are the thoughts of men. You think like men, you're not thinking like God. The divine light that radiates from the Messiah is to make us move beyond and transcend those human limitations. To not just, to not be like everyone else in our plodding along and our thinking, but to think as the children of God. And that's completely different. Which is why when we mention about the individual aspect, our Lord immediately goes on and says, and anyone, after they've just watched Peter be dragged through the coals, and our Lord turns to the rest of the people listening to him, and he says, and anyone who's ashamed of me before other men, I shall be ashamed of before my Father when I return in the glory of my Father with the angels. Do we live that gospel so that it's a reality? Or do we kind of shuffle and kick our feet of, well, you know, gosh, are we actually gonna say a blessing at the restaurant? We'll do it at home, but gosh, we're in public. Make the sign of the cross in public? I mean, I'll do it at church, but come on, you know. This is McDonald's. That's the notion of shame. You hide it. But our Lord says, if you're ashamed of me before other men, then when I return in glory with the angels of my Father, I will be ashamed of you on that day of judgment, which indicates a not a very good destiny after that. So our Lord makes very clear, this is hard, but this is something which has profound lessons to it, which is why when he talks about this aspect of shame, he immediately then says, but there are some of you who are standing here now who will not taste death, before they see the kingdom of God come in power. Then we have today's gospel of the transfiguration. So if you understand its context and its reality, it's why the church in general, but especially the Eastern churches, have made such emphasis placed upon the transfiguration because the entire gospel is there. The whole episode of the reality of carrying the cross behind our Lord is there in this transfiguration. Which is why for us, it's on August 6th is the actual feast day. But you notice in your red books at the beginning where it says at the beginning of the mass, it says also repeated on the Sunday. So that you never miss it. And every year we return to the glory that God promises us, but simultaneously the reminder that this costs something. We do it because it is the radiance of truth to follow the light of the gospel, not because it's about me feeling good. Our Lord gives us wonderful consolations often, and oftentimes we do feel wonderful, but oftentimes we feel like rubbish. But the gospel remains true, in season, out of season, in the light and in the darkness, which is why I leave you with the one last quotation from this episode also. So our Lord's talking about this struggle, and he's talking about the fact that you cannot be ashamed of the gospel before others. And he asks the question, you know the text already, you know the quotation. But our Lord says, for what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit someone to gain the entire world, but in the end, lose his soul. Now this is in the Greek term of psuche. Psuche is where we get our word psychology from. But psuche refers to soul in the general sense. It also refers to that emotional level, thinking level, but it also refers to selfhood, psuche. So what our Lord is saying is, Really, in the end, when you calculate and you're looking at your books and balancing your checkbook, if we do that anymore, and you're looking at all the things that they cost, 
Our Lord says that in the end, what is the value really of the world? We heard tragically yesterday with this Epstein man who was alleged to have committed horrible crimes against women and girls. Multi-billionaire had the entire world. And we're told yesterday that they found him dead in his cell from suicide as he was put on trial in New York. This is tragic, but I bring it up because it's illustrative. What does it matter if you have everything, but in the end you lose yourself? This is what our Lord throws into the context of this whole transfiguration. I promise you light, I promise you eternal happiness in that divine light, but in the meantime, you must be proud of the gospel that you've received. You must be radiant with light, not be ashamed of this gospel. And you must follow me to Calvary because the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. But the consolation is, he says, that on the third day, he will rise from the dead. We have promises and we have demands put on us by the gospel. And the transfiguration is beautiful in that and we should spend these next few days meditating on it. What does it profit any of us to gain anything, let alone the entire world, but at the cost of losing our own lives, of losing ourselves and suffering the loss of our soul? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Telot madeb hei daloho, walot aloho dan farekayo. 
Mighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Claire. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. 
May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, o holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. Hidden from all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom, through the grace of your only Son, and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, you are adored by all. Angels bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming. To you, O God, the Heavenly Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your Majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb, that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, and so through that his grace we may become your children and heirs. 
He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us, for he is your only Son. Do this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion, which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name, by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us to be worthy with, to make us to be worthy with you in holiness, with one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, 
For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite modro chocheu kadisho, onachen alainu al korbono hono. Let this bread and the body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And let the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that renews the new life to those who receive it, and a blood that gives us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. <laughs> o Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults and forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the Word of Truth, so that they may spread it faithfully. With justice and holiness may they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will, and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith, and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the glorious and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner who witnessed the betrothal of your holy family to your son, glorious St. Stephen the Archdeacon and First Martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your sins, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O oh Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. 
Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you. And join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will. That in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit. Now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. You sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, so that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. With your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God. 
so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy love, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord, our God, to you be glory. Again, we thank you, O Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body and your and your living blood to drink, the lover of all people. Have mercy on us.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you when we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the holy cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So we do have two announcements. One, of course, this coming Thursday is the Feast of the Assumption, the Dormition of Our Lady. So it's a holy day of obligation, so we are meant to, as children of God, treat it as a Sunday, which means we have to assist at Mass and also to desist from servile labor. It's unnecessary. And so Masses for the Dormition will be on Wednesday, the Vigil at 6 p.m., and on Thursday morning at 9 a.m. The second announcement is we have more books that we've put out into the pews on the Maronite Church. You're more than welcome to take them. In fact, please take them and use them apostolically. Speak to your friends. You can communicate as to what you do at that funny little church ahead of Falls <coughs> in its ancient traditions of Antioch. So please, by all means, take copies of the book. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.